Hello and welcome again to the uh, podcast for the, it'll be our first in the spring uh, quarter and Becky is our writer. I'm really excited about the spring quarter. I think we've hit the right, um, the right tone, I guess. Like there's a good combination of scholarship and a good combination of just the devotional aspect that, that the encounter yeah. oftentimes brings. And so I'm really, really excited about this and I hope you're blessed. And so before we get started, I'm going to let my co-host here introduce themselves. Logan, I'm going to let you go first today. Tell them about what you do. Well, I'm the pastor at Mars Hill CP Church, and you can look us up on Facebook and hear the sermons. I'm also the uh, host of the Monday Morning Megaphone, new episode every Monday. You can find that wherever podcast, wherever you can find podcasts, whether it be on Spotify, TuneIn, uh, Radio Public. And I'm also the host of a new podcast or the co-host of a new podcast called Cult Crimes and Criminal Minds. Uh, I do that with another fellow pastor. And we look at the different cults and some of the crimes they commit and provide theological analysis and uh, historical analysis on some of those crimes. Well, that's cool. I did not know about that. So Yeah, that's, that's cool. just that's a new thing. I like it, like it, like it. All right, Reverend Becky, what you got? Good morning, or afternoon, or whatever you're listening to. I, I, I'm don't, I don't see your halo. What, that, what no, I took my halo off. <laughs> I took it down for the moment, but I may have to put it back up. Um, I am the pastor at Madisonville First Cumberland Presbyterian and Rose Creek Cumberland Presbyterian, both in Western Kentucky. You can find us on Facebook. Um, you can also find me on YouTube if you type in Rebecca Zardi. I host a bi-weekly um, video devotional series that comes out on Monday and Friday called Welcome Back to My Porch and would love for you to subscribe and join me on our journey through our devotionals there um, as well as um, Facebook you know if you want to message us there um, and contact we'd certainly love to have a conversation with you. And I'll also put in a plug for our um, Linton journey that uh, the discipleship ministry team is doing that's on the Yap app you can find that in the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store and uh, Reverend Becky has uh, Sunday video devotionals on that as well. And one of the neat things she's doing is going to different churches and kind of showing the different buildings in the, her area as settings to do those devotions. So I appreciate everybody who's been using those. We've, we've had a lot of interaction and it's been good. And, and so I appreciate all the work that went into that. Thank you, Becky. And uh, so we'll go in March the 7th is when this lesson uh, you'll be teaching or you'll be um, in Sunday school. It's uh, from Luke chapter 15. We've titled it Lost and Found. I'm going to have our prayer for illumination. Rejoicing Father, you celebrate when one of your lost children is found because no one is worthless to you. We stand humbled and in awe that you would count us among your most prized possessions. Give us eyes to see the priceless value of every living soul for the sake of the one who became human for the sake of our souls. Jesus Christ, our seeker. Amen. I like that. That's a good one. Memory verse, Luke chapter 15, verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That's Luke 15, 24. That's an awesome verse. Um, and actually, so it just dawned upon me. One of my favorite Dolly Parton songs. Dolly Parton is having a renaissance. Everybody loves Dolly right now for, for, for whatever reason. But she sings uh, a song called The Seeker, which is an amazingly great song. Mm -hmm. and I love it yeah. very much. So. If you want to start your Sunday school class with the seeker, go for it, because it's a, it's one that points to God as the one who seeks us. So, Amen. all right, introduction, Reverend Becky, what you got? All right, well, actually, I remember verse really plays right into the introduction, and I'm sure the parents, most everybody can relate to what happened in this situation. So I was, I was shopping with my two small children at the time. Um, my son was probably around four and my daughter would have been about two. So I had her in the shopping cart where she couldn't run off on me. And my son was hanging out in the front of the shopping cart and we were going through the store and I'd stopped to look at something that was on the rack and turned around and he was gone. I mean, he was absolutely gone. I couldn't find him. And of course my mind started racing what was going on trying to make sense of what I was, I was doing. And of course, you know, as a parent, all those beautiful things that you've seen on TV or in the movies or running books and magazines started running through your head like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what if somebody stole my kid? What if somebody stole my kid? 
And it was at that moment of just sheer panic that I had that the clothing rack in front of me wiggled and I could hear a little giggle. And I, every time I read this and every time I really just sit and think about that memory, it just, it really makes me cry because it was just that, that intense moment of recognizing that my lost son was found again. Um, and just the sheer, both anger that I had at him at that moment, like, why did you do that to me? And elation that, oh my gosh, he's here and nobody has run off with him. And both at the same moment. And I, and I can kind of put that into the position of this, this lost son. He's found again, he was dead and alive. Yeah. And I'm sure people can relate to that. I'm sure. I, I remember when I was a young and I remember I got lost in, in like a, a HG Hill store. I don't even know if they're around anymore, but I remember I was crying. I, I don't know how me and my mom got separated. I think even like I'm 40 and she has, I think, a GPS on my phone. I don't know how in the world I got away from her when I was four. But uh, I remember I had to, like a little attendant person found me and then they're like, Oh, we have a lost child on it anyway. But I found oh. my mother found me. It was fun. Oh, that's sweet. I'm sure she was panicking the whole time. I know too. she was. I know it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Tough. But um, that's a good setup. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about things that are lost and the deep meaning that we that God attaches to those lost uh, souls in our case. But we also yeah. in our story are there are objects which people hold dearly and when they're lost you see the seriousness of which they want to find uh, that lost thing. And so um, I, I pray that all of our current mothers don't have to experience those feelings as right. well either. Yeah. All right. So let's jump into this historical setting, uh, exploring the scripture part. And let me tell me what you were going for there. I really wanted people to understand what these images that Jesus sometimes uses very strange things to us that we read them in our modern context and we're like I don't get it what was the big deal about this but he uses some really good analogies here um first of all you know shepherds we talk about shepherds all the way through scripture but what we don't understand and don't recognize is that shepherds were not awesome people they were not people that were well thought of they were not well um looked at you know they were I point out here that they thought of them as dirty, sneaky, and untrustworthy individuals, and yet these are the people that God uses. How many of our, our main characters through scripture were shepherds of some kind? Um, and shepherding, it was a family affair. It was something that we all did together. And fat-tailed sheep, I want you to Google fat-tailed sheep. That just totally <laughs> fascinated me when I was doing the research on this. Um, and it will make sense. It will make more sense to you as you read scripture and look at a lot of the sacrifices when they're talking about the fat of the tail of the sheep. Because in our context, we see this nice little cute woolly thing with this little <laughs> tiny bob tail. And that is not what a fat tailed sheep is. A fat tailed um, so sheep is the, a fat tailed sheep. <laughs> is a fat tailed sheep. It is truly a fat tailed sheep. And so it will make more sense to you when you read scripture that oh, this is the kind of sheep that they cared for. This is the kind of sheep that they bred. So these are the kind of sheep that they were using in their sacrifices. Um, and then our coins, you know, we see a lot of imagery in history of women wearing coins and wearing all sorts of gold and silver bangles and jewels and stuff. And what we don't understand that this was their livelihood. So if something, you know, if they were traveling with their spouse and their spouse died suddenly somewhere, this is, this is the way that was going to pay for their way to either get back to their home country or to take care of them where they were. And so they carried their piggy bank with them. And that's not something we think about often, which is why a lot of these women are, um, shown through historical paintings and um, just pictures of, of wearing coins because that that was their livelihood they took that with them wherever they go so this woman losing this coin was a huge deal for her this was part of her livelihood if something happened to her spouse um, and then of course we get into the prodigal son which is a story that we all know very well well we, hopefully yes hopefully right? you know it really well <laughs> yeah. 
Well, so, you were talking about uh, the shepherds there, and it kind of reminded me of the narrative in Luke 2, where the, I think it's Luke 2, where the angels come to the shepherds, and they right. announce, they, they announce that Jesus is coming into the world, and so what's really interesting is that God is using shepherds in, yes. in that passage as well to convey a, the message of Jesus, and shepherds, like you said, they weren't, they weren't the greatest uh, they weren't the most morally upright people. They, but they were. Society viewed them as a necessary evil. So, right. I think um, now, not to offend any tradesmen in our audience, but I think uh, shepherds were viewed the same way some of us might view electricians and plumbers. Like sure. we look on electricians and plumbers, and we think, yeah, we need those guys to come and work on our house sometimes. But we don't. We feel like they're trying to rip us off a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, and, and they may not, and, they, and they, not to say that everyone, every electrician and plumber is going to rip you off, but that's the way we feel about them whenever we get that bill, you know. Yeah. Like we're paying or how car, much? And car he, mechanics, you know, that's or car mechanics, yeah. 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 And so these were, and so really, my, my I guess my point in, not, in saying all this is that shepherds were just the regular blue collar guys yeah. that, mm -hmm. that everyone kind of looked down on and just tolerated. Yeah. I, you know, I, my father was a um, body shop supply guy and he sold body shop supplies to body shops, of course, because that's what a body shop supply guy does. <laughs> but anyway, right? I got to meet a lot of people that worked in the body shop. And then I can imagine that shepherds were probably the same type, rough and tumble, blue collar, great people. Probably you didn't bring home for dinner all the time, but you love them, right? I mean, like, you know, yeah. and, and so, and I think about that, Becky, you worked in the restaurant, same thing. There's some oh, people yeah. you'll meet there that are a little rough, rough under the collar. Yep. They get the job yep. done, and uh, and 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 you love them for it. But yeah, that's that's pretty fun. The other thing I was thinking about with the uh, um, silver coins, this has nothing to do with the lesson. But as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, there's about to be a whole generation of kids that won't even know what a coin is, really, because everything's so. Electronic. Oh, I know. So just that's true. We're in the midst of seeing this uh, story become even more. Uh, yeah, ancient, antiquated. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and there there are kids now that don't know what cassette tapes are, and it irritates yeah. me. Yeah, and CDs are going the going the same way now. So uh -huh. everything's digital. I, I saw this meme where I saw this meme where someone had taken a picture of an old cassette tape, and they yeah. said, "My kid found it was like the best of Leonard Skinner," and it, it, the meme said, "My kid found this in the creek and wanted to know if it was from the Civil War." <laughs> 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 there are some fun videos out there of kids looking at cassette yeah. tapes or Walkmans. That's a good one. A Walkman. Yeah, thing. that's a good one too. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and then um, we didn't talk so much about the the uh, last parable with the prodigal son. But one thing we probably need to highlight is is the because uh, you wouldn't necessarily know it if you if you're not if you haven't studied the story or new Jewish culture for that young man to end up in the pigsty. It's not family. just like depression. It was as if he had been cast out of his own society. Like he was mm -hmm. no longer even part of, of, like even slave didn't sleep with foreigners, didn't sleep with the pigs, right? So he had found right. himself in a, in a situation in which not only had he messed up, he, he was messed up and isolated. Right. And, so. and truly, I mean, truly at that moment in time, truly at rock bottom there was no no, no transition door. it was there in life yeah <laughs> that you could go any lower this was it <laughs> yeah so so that, i it. think you did a really good job i think bringing bringing out the cultural significance of these things and i think that'll be a breath of fresh air well not a breath of fresh air but new information for people as they go through right. and so good yeah. job there and make sure you google fat tail sheep fat tail sheep and then clear oh. your search history so no one thinks you're weird <laughs> right so before i get um before i get too far i did forget to highlight our discussion question from the introduction and so i do want to i do want to ask that so the discussion question to start this whole lesson off was describe a time when you were lost spiritually or physically how did you get back on the right path who helped you how would you describe the emotions of being lost and found logan i'll let you shoot for that one first well um I was a couple, a couple instances. First, it's kind of a, a cute story. I was like eight or nine years old and I was in Kmart with my grandma 
and we were in the pharmacy section and she was looking for something. I don't remember what she was looking for. And then I turned my head to look at something. And when I turned around, she was gone and I was freaking out. And, um, it, it, it's funny because it, it must've been like five minutes. It must've been like five minutes from the time that I was lost into the time that I found her, but it felt like an eternity for me. Mm -hmm. And then I found someone who works there and I was like, I lost my grandma. Can you help me find my grandma? They're like, what does she look like? I'm like, grandma, (laughs) she's an old lady. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Thanks kid. That really narrows it down. And then I saw her coming around the corner and I was like, where were you? I was so scared. She's like, I just walked around the corner. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then, um, and then I don't know. I, um, another instance i guess i was lost a little bit I, well i was lost i um and when about the time i was 18 years old i was you know i i've told y'all before that i was raised pentecostal and i was just getting to a point when i was about 18 years old where i just was reading the bible and studying the bible and trying to figure it out and i didn't really have any help at the time because i had mm-hmm. questions about some of the stuff i was reading and um my sweet pentecostal grandparents and and my pastor and everybody no one really had any answers that satisfied me and so i just didn't really know i i knew that i couldn't belong in the pentecostal church anymore because i was starting to believe some things that they didn't um and i was just really and every time i went to church i was just looking at the church with a critical eye and i didn't want to go to church and look look at and look with a critical eye every time i went to worship god you know so i didn't really know Yeah, so I didn't really know where I belonged, and then like these couple of Mormon missionaries knocked on my door one day, and uh, I started studying the Bible with them, and of course they introduced me to the Book of Mormon, and I didn't really know where else to turn because I didn't really have that many friends outside of my Pentecostal circle. And so I, I started going to church with them. I was eventually baptized into the Mormon church and became a Mormon for like, I don't know. I, was, I wasn't really hot and heavy with it because I still had doubts about it. But, but at least they were willing to answer questions for me, even if they were the wrong answers. <laughs> at, least the, at least they were willing to give it a shot rather than just say, oh, right. pray about it, kid. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I was I was involved in the Mormon Church for in the in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints for like six to nine months I guess, um, and then after a while I was just like, after a while I was just like I really don't belong here either. This is kind of like it it provides structure and that's good, but this whole Book of Mormon origin story it's like some sci fi BS and I can't I can't really buy into it and so i left and i just didn't really know where to go from there i went from pentecostal to mormon and then like there was a methodist church in the area and so i went there for a little while and i was a methodist for about five minutes and then i kind of settled into a baptist church plant and then i finally found a home in the cumberland presbyterian church so when i read the confession of faith and i got when I, I didn't really start, I, I got a hold of the confession of faith and I read it and I was like, well, this is what I believed. This is what I believe, but I didn't really want to go to the CP church in my hometown because the pastor there wasn't even CP. He was free will Baptist. You know, that's a con. I found out that's a common problem in, in our CP churches. And so I didn't want to go there. I actually wanted to go where there was a CP pastor who could help me. And I didn't really have the opportunity to do that in our area. And then I got an open door to go fill the pulpit at a CP church. Okay. That's another story. Right. So, uh, but when I finally got settled into the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and got to understanding what they believed and why, I was just, just like, okay, this is home. This is, this is really, yeah. this is legitimate Christian doctrine. I understand all of these things and, uh, and I'm thankful for it. Amen. So um, I, I got out of the Baptist church plant 
at about the time that I started flirting with infant baptism and understanding Reformed theology a lot better. And then when I got into the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and found out, okay, well, they're Reformed, but they're not, you know, capital R Reformed. That's okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they do infant baptism and they believe in salvation by grace alone, faith alone. All right. Here we are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and amen. Right. I kind of already talked about my being lost in, in H.G. Hills or whatnot, but uh I would also say, though, when I was 18 or 19, I didn't realize how how lost I was. I was a spiritual desert when, before I became a Christian, and it wasn't until after I became a Christian, and I looked back and thought, well, I was a terrible, empty person with, you know, like, and, and the emotions from that I get still today because I look and I see people still struggling with the same things, it, whether it's my children that maybe haven't taken the spirituality thing as serious, and I thought, and I look at them and they're hurting in some ways and they don't uh-huh. know where to go and it causes anxiety. And, and I, I want to say it. And I do like, I'm like, well, you know, like uh, Augustine says, you've made us for yourself and we're restless till our hearts find rest in thee. Right. So Amen. Yeah. But I did, I'm thankful that the Lord pulled me out of that. Uh, not that I got anything right. I'm still terrible in a lot of ways, but I know there's a seeker. Yeah, I say that, and so um, you're a work in progress. Yeah, so that's good. work in progress. Becky, yeah, did you want absolutely. to expand, or do you just want to use your lost son as the? <laughs> well, no, um, I, I will say that my lost story, of course, is is one like many people. Um, I left um, the Church of Christ when I was 23, and I spent 10 years just doing my own thing. <laughs> you know. Um, partied a lot, um, drank a lot, and um, of course, um, with alcohol, there's a certain lifestyle that kind of goes along with that, and uh, did a lot of things that that um, hurt me um, emotionally and mentally. Um, and when I was 33, um, Tara Sesco came into my life, and praise God for her. Um, cause she kind of helped point me back in the right direction, loved me right where I was at. And, uh, CP church became my home when I was 33 and, uh, and I haven't looked back since, you know, praise, praise God that, um, you know, talk about the emotions of being lost and found, you know, there were a lot of things that I had to work through, uh, forgiving myself for, for what I had done and um, before I could move forward. Yeah. And that was, that was difficult that was very difficult because there were a lot of things that I regret um, that I ever entertained and or did. And, um, you know, but, you know, praise God that he loves us and, and welcomes us home when we come home, when we make that decision to say, okay, yeah, I screwed up and I'm sorry. And let's kill the fatted calf and have a party because you have made the choice to come home. That's good, and I, I think that leads us then in, into the to the next what we're going to do for this podcast because they're kind of just so melded together. Like the mm-hmm. we're just going to do the next the digging deeper and the learning from the scripture of the church kind of together. Mm-hmm. So um, we'll start, but but I'll ask you. So you start the digging deeper um, section with the the kind of the clash between Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus eating yep. with those no good sinners. So where, where yeah. are we headed on that section? Yeah, you know, Jesus really threw everything on its head. He just, he flipped it upside down. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, it's a very upside down kingdom. Um, and he displayed that, that he ate with people that were tax collectors and sinners, the sex workers. And these are the people that he hung out with. And the Pharisees were like, what? are you doing? That's not something we do. And Jesus was trying to explain to them, listen, you know, righteous people don't need to be saved. The lost people need to be saved. And that's what I've come to do. I've come to seek and save those that were lost. And so he really just kind of threw the Pharisees around for a loop and, and throws us still for a loop today because we can be very Pharisaical in our thought process and the way we treat people. Um, and we need to remind ourselves that that's not 
that's not what Jesus exemplified in his life is that he went to looking for those lost people to bring them home. Yeah. And, and so I let's think, start with that. Yeah. So when I hear you say that, I get two, two images in my mind. I mean, in the sense of, I see Jesus loving people mm-hmm. just for people's sake, regardless where they are in life. Just, he had a heart for people, hurt people, and I think even Jesus had, I mean, you know, you don't see it, but I, and I, I don't know if I can pull, well, yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, Jesus loved not only the marginalized, he loved the people that were on top too. And his yeah. process was to bring everyone together under the need of grace and then the transformation of heart. And so, so we sometimes get lost and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to get in, in any bogged down in anything but jesus loved all people like the marginalized and the people on top and the goal was transformation i want to say that and then the second thing was the the emphasis wasn't just on the hanging out and the love it was the transformation like he was on a mission to seek and then save that which was lost right and Mm -hmm. so it wasn't just a i love everybody for this for just the sake of loving everybody, I guess it was, but it was also for transformation. So that's what mm-hmm. I get when I hear you talk mm-hmm. there. You know, you were talking about how, Becky, you were talking about how we, we needed to be careful or else we'll wind up being pharisaical. It reminded me of myself in high school. I I was a big jerk in high school. Um, I didn't think so at the time, but I was just a giant butthole of a person and what it all came down to is I just didn't think that everyone else was I thought everyone else should be as righteous as me and should be a a good example like me and I shoved it in everyone's faces as a matter of fact when I was in high school I wouldn't even participate in the in our CSU in our Christian student union because Mm. they weren't Christian enough for me um And at one point, I even tried to start a competing uh, Christian student union to kind of to kind of, because I, I felt like, hol- you know, it's, holiness was a big deal for me growing up Pentecostal. But the problem was I didn't even really know what holiness was. I thought it was about mm. the way you dressed. I thought it was, you know, about not smoking, not cussing, not drinking. And so I felt I felt like because I didn't do certain things and didn't participate in certain things that I was more righteous than everybody else. Right. And I, and I yeah. wanted to flaunt that. Um, and so, yeah, I just, every, so every time I start getting a little self-righteous or I just remember how bad I was in high school and I think, Oh no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And it wasn't until my, it, it wasn't until my senior year, in high school that I started to loosen up a little bit, but by then the damage had already been done with, with my relationships with people. Yeah. I wanted to bring up something. One of the things that I realized while I was looking, um, is it seven twelve? Uh, I, it's in the sermon on the Mount. It's, uh, when Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Is that Matthew seven or Matthew six? It's at the end of Matthew five. Matthew, Matthew five. All right. So anyway, I wanted to read that. And here's what, I, when I was studying one time, um, it's, so he's going over basically the Jewish law in Matthew chapter five. And then he's kind of saying, you've heard this, but I say unto whatever. Uh-huh. So in Matthew mm-hmm. chapter five, verse 43, Jesus says, you have heard said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, uh, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And so what Mm -hmm. what I learned from that was that at least the preceding passage and then I, and then if you go over into chapter six it says be beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them anyway it made some translations see be holy therefore as your father your heavenly father is holy and from that time i started thinking mercy is a part of holiness 
like a very distinct part of holding. I mean, like a big part of it. And so when you were talking, Logan, I, I thought to myself, Jesus specifically said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, be perfect like God is perfect. And so um, I have always tried to do my best to be holy, you know, and to do, do right things. But then I also realized I'm not being merciful. And just because I can, right. I can check off all these boxes, but I'm not being merciful. I've missed that boat. Of course, you know how Jesus right. yeah. says it right there. He, yeah. God treats people the same, right? Yes. And, and be merciful. So therefore, if you're going to be holy, mercy's yeah. part of that. <laughs> right. Well, right. that, and I think with that passage in Matthew 5, 43, I think we have a distorted view of what biblical perfection is. Uh, like yeah. whenever we think of what, whenever we think of perfection, whenever we think of perfect, we have a very Western understanding of perfection. And we don't, we mm -hmm. don't realize that our under our Western understanding of perfect or perfection is it's got to be spotless, flawless, and there has to be no mistakes and no impurities. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to do that. And so whenever we read Matthew 5, 43, and where Jesus says, be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect, we, we really try to downplay that. We try to distort it in, in a way that Jesus doesn't mean, right. or we look at it and we, we make the mistake of looking at it and saying, oh, well, Jesus doesn't really mean to be perfect. What he means is we need to see our need for him through, through our failings right. and you know, and then trust him. And that's true, but that's not what that passage means. Jesus means exactly what he says, be perfect, even as God is perfect. And so in order to understand, in order to accept what Jesus says at face value, we then have to reorient our understanding of what perfection is. Mm. Biblical perfection is not spotless and flawless and completely sinless. It has nothing to do with that. Per biblical perfection is maturity. If you go back and you read the old King James Version uh, in the book of James, James says something along the lines of how we need to pursue perfection or, or be perfect in all that we do or things like that. Um, and what James, and if you read it in modern translations, what James says is that we need to be mature. Mm. So what Jesus is saying is you need to be much, you need to pursue maturity in your dealings with other people, even as your father in heaven is mature in all that he does. And so, and so God is the ultimate standard in how we treat one another. God is the ultimate standard in how we act. God is, and then, and God acts without prejudice and God acts without bias and so we need to be loving like God. We need to pursue that ideal. Uh, and so, you, you know, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, because I have that, because I, I have that understanding of Matthew five forty three, I probably uh, take some of the wind out of your sails if you if you use the if you use the uh, the Sermon on the Mount to say, oh well, we can't do this. We just need to look to Jesus. No, it's both. <laughs> no, it's both. Yeah, it's both. And yeah, one of absolutely. the reasons that I started studying that Be Perfect is, I, in my life, David is a hero of mine because he was terrible, but yet a man after God's own heart. And so I thought, how can you reconcile those two things? And it's because mm -hmm. he had a passionate love for Christ. And if you see his dealings, he, he sucked with Uriah in that, but he was a person who cared deeply about about being being righteous he sucked at it sometimes but it was his intention and he did seek to be for his time i mean he wasn't trying to be christ-like necessarily he was trying to be godlike. like uh, he just was terrible at it sometimes but he was still a person after god's own heart and and that's how i reconcile those two things is that maturity you can be mature and you, you still have moments of stupidity moments of falling fallenness um, but your your dead set core is to try to do the best you can, the right thing, mm -hmm. treat people right and correctly as yeah. as God does, I guess. Right. Right. And I think and I, and I think one of the things that will help us uh, is to look at John Wesley's. Uh, I don't know if it's a book or a sermon, um, but I know John Wesley wrote it. It's called On Christian Perfection. Um, 
I'm going to I'm, I'm going to look that up. Send the link to Chris so he can put that in the resources. We I think the resources because Chris has shared. That oh, document. that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. So we'll we'll put I'll put that in the resources and we'll um we'll get that to you. Um. So anyway, I'm done talking. I talked entirely too much there. But uh, so keep going there, Becky. If you got. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. I mean, you know, all of that with the mercy and just understanding that we need to work on our maturity, you know, and isn't that a work in progress for all of us? So that kind of leads us into that whole analogy of the shepherd then and relying upon God. You know, you talked about it with the Sermon on the Mount, um, that Jesus shows us things that we need to do, but who's our great shepherd? Jesus is our great shepherd. God is our shepherd and he provides us everything that we need to do what he calls us to do. And that's that maturity and faith. That's that understanding of who we're supposed to be. That's that seeking the lost souls, even when it's really hard. Um, you know, I think about myself personally and, and offering that mercy to other, you know, if you, if you knew my story, which Chris, I think, you know, and Logan, you know, part of my story, um, if I didn't have people that God put in my life that were willing to seek and save the lost and forgive me for things that I thought were unforgivable and offer me mercy um, in those places, um, I would not be sitting in the position that I am today. I would still be very, very lost and, and wandering the wastelands and trying to find my way home. Um, and afraid because part of my fear was Logan, like you at one point in my life, I had that very self-righteous attitude. You know, when I was in high school, my early twenties, I really thought that I had it all together. And that if everybody just believed the scripture, the way that I believe the scripture to say, then, then we would be fine. And I don't understand why you don't see it the way that you see it. And I don't understand why you don't act the way that you're supposed to act. And then, um, and, and, and God showed me, he kind of put me in my place for a little while so that when I came back, I have that mercy and that understanding that we're not all going to walk the same path at the same time. Um, and that's something I think we need to recognize as well. Um, and you know who else in our story felt self or was self-righteous? Yeah. It was the older brother. The older uh, brother. And so what I was telling, I was telling Chris and Becky this before the podcast but you could easily um you could easily if you wanted to break this up into a two-part sermon you could preach on the sun that runs away um mm -hmm. on the first in the first week and then you could come back the next week and talk about the older son and then you could add another one on and talk about the father you mm -hmm. could yes yeah. um yeah. you could yes and as a matter of fact i've seen the I'd, I'd have to look for it but i've seen a sermon where someone actually preached a sermon called the, uh, the prodigal father. And the reason they called it the prodigal father was because whenever we think of the word prodigal, like the word prodigal is not in the text of scripture. Uh, we just kind of added that on, but the word prodigal, I think it actually means wasteful. Yes. And so whenever we talk about the prodigal son, we talk about the son who went and wasted his father's inheritance mm -hmm. and the sermon that i'm referring to actually argued that it was the father who was a prodigal because he gave his inheritance to his son right. um knowing that his son was mad at him knowing that his son wanted him dead knowing that his son would probably waste it um because gave like, it to him anyway right and if you're a parent of more than one child you're probably going to have that one child who you're like, you know, this one will be fine once they get out of the house and get on their own. But this other one, I can't even trust them with matches when I turn around. So, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> so he, the, the father knew what he was doing and it was waste in a, in a way it was wasteful. And so you could do, there's a, there's a, and, and there's a sermon there about how God seemingly wastes his grace. Mm -hmm. He pours out his love, he pours out his mercy, and then what do we do? We waste it. Yeah, and so that's the amazing part of grace. I did want to bring that up. I mean, when you talk about the prodigal being wasteful, 
every single one of these stories in a sense is a, is a waste. And, and so like, if you think about the lost sheep, um, I, I told them that I had read, listened to or something where a um, scholar, pastor, whatever, had reintroduced or reinterpreted these in a sense to say, really how smart is it for the shepherd to leave 99 sheep unprotected from wolves to go find the one like it's it's wasteful in that sense it doesn't make any sense or a lady who has lost one coin that is so valuable to her that when she finds it she probably spends more than that coin's worth to celebrate the fact that she got it back mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like logan just said the, the father knows that this is going to be a complete and total waste of his money and and whatnot but he allows it because he knows that he has a chance to get his son back too. Like, so every right. single one of these is somewhat of a, I don't want to say a waste because you get what you want, but I guess mm -hmm. it does also focus on the fact that the relationship or the having or the possessing the, the togetherness is more important than any of the material mm -hmm. that you would otherwise have. Like, mm -hmm. So if the shepherd went to find that one sheep and a couple pack of wolves came by, you're down four or five sheep at that point, but you got the one right. sheep, so it doesn't make sense, right? But uh, So anyway, I think that's a good interpretation of it. It's an extremely extravagant, seemingly wasteful, amazing mm -hmm. grace of God. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a story that makes us think people are valuable, like really valuable. Yes, sure. Absolutely. You know, I think about my lost story in that, in that aspect, because I've often wondered why, why did God let me wander away for that 10 years and do some of the awful things that I did? Why? But I see how he's used that in my ministry today. Um, cause I talk to people that have been through very similar circumstances uh, women that have been through similar situations and they don't feel like God could ever forgive them and let them come home. And I'm like, but no, let me tell you, here's my testimony. And this is what I'm going to tell you. Yes. Yes. You can come home that God loves you irregardless of what you have done in the past, that he loves you right where you're at. And he wants you back into that fold um, so sometimes I think God allows things in our life to happen through our own choices. I'm not saying that, you know, we didn't have a part in that. We definitely did. We made that choice to wander away. I, mean, I was perfect. Um, I just got, yeah, I'm <laughs> sure you need the halo. You need the halo, Chris. <laughs> <I'm natural. laughs> you know, but he uses that, that opportunity for those of us that were lost, that wandered through a very dark desert place to testify about God's goodness and his mercy and how much he really loves and cares for you to bring people back to the fold. And so it might look to the outside world like that's wasteful or that person's life is wasteful. But in reality, you know, what are they going to do in the end? And that we don't know. We don't have that big picture that's because that's some of those people come back and man, are soul winners like crazy because of the things that they've gone through in their life, even though it looks like they're wasting it. I want to give Logan a chance as we were preparing for this, he brought up something and it ties into what you were saying, Becky, how sometimes we think we're irredeemable or whatnot. And then we practice these storylines in our mind and we tell ourselves how bad we are and whatnot. And then it, it stops us from moving forward sometimes i see that a lot in pastoral right. counseling but logan you had brought up while we were getting ready for this how this this prodigal son this wasteful son practiced a script in his mind to try to so i'm going to let you take it and just explain what you were you know. yeah so I've, I've preached this before um whenever i've gone over the parable of the prodigal son i noticed when i was going over the text that in in uh, luke 15 verse uh 18 i'm reading from the christian standard bible it says i'll get up he's practicing this script in his mind and he says i'll get up i'll go to my father and say to him father i have sinned against heaven and in your sight and i'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired workers and so then he so verse 20 says he got up and he went to his father 
But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son starts going over that script that he practiced in his mind. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. In verse 22, it says, But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And so he doesn't even get to finish the script that he practiced in his mind. He doesn't get to tell his father how unworthy he is. And think about that. God doesn't let you tell him how, how unworthy you are. <laughs> like love interrupted, love interrupts, yeah. right? So yeah. you want to come to God and say, God, I'm unworthy. I'm so sorry I've done this. And yes, you, you should be repentant. Repentance is an appropriate response when you realize you sinned. But you don't get to come to God and determine on what conditions God can forgive you and redeem you. Mm, so so we we have this in our and, and we do this all the time we say we say we bargain with god and we say god i'll god get me out of this mess and i'll serve you god do this for me and i will do whatever you want and we try to bargain with god and you don't get to bargain with grace right and that story as i was thinking about it this week it really pushes that uh you know i told y'all last week i i have this penchant in this this thing for um, purgatory because I want, I, I just want to suffer for the bad things I did. But then you know, it's, in some way, it's just, it would make me feel better to know that I had, I don't know, but, but hey, like, penance. Well, I mean, you know, it's just like Becky, like you said, I can't believe people, I'm not worthy of somebody just saying, ah, forget it. It sucked. You acknowledge it. Let's move on. Right. Like, no, let me beat myself or something, right? Like, yeah. because I yeah. just need to feel it a little more. And so it's when when God interrupts you, I like the way you say love interrupt, interrupted. Yeah. And and man, just part of me thinks, and can it be? Like, can it really be true? And 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 I think it can. I just you gotta live into that too. I mean, you gotta mm -hmm meditate on that a little bit mm -hmm. i don't know i love that it's really good i don't think that parable will ever get old for that reason but before we move on because this kind of helps with some of the application of the of the text too um you had brought it up logan let's talk about the jesus was talking to the pharisees right or he was he was saying this in the midst of the pharisees and really, maybe another person that I've read before said the prodigal son's not really the point of the story. The point of the story was the other brother, because the other brother was the greatest symbol of Pharisaic practice of faith that you because he was mad because God or the father enjoyed the bad son. <laughs> and so the, right. the brother, the righteous brother, is called out for his hate. And of course, he doesn't get the fatted calf. And he doesn't get the party because his heart wasn't right. But anyway, what do y'all think there? Well, I mean, I think I think the story in the story the the what the father says is true. You know, you know, you're he tells the elder brother you're angry about all this stuff, but it's always been available to you. All right. And so you know, you compare that to compare that to the to the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, and then go back to what mm -hmm. Paul says in Romans nine. Paul, Paul says in Romans 9 that, you know, he wished that he could be cut off for the sake of his Jewish brothers. But then he said, and he says that, he says, we owe a lot to Jews in a way because to them belong the law and the prophets and to them, you know, ha, that belong revelations and all these things. And so it's, these things have always been available to them. But now Jesus has come along and then they reject Jesus they reject the fulfillment of all of those things. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons was because there was mercy being shown to the sinners and the tax collectors. Yes. Right. right. So yeah. they re so they reject the fulfillment of all of those things. And then people come along, Gentiles specifically come along and see Jesus and uh, see Jesus. And they understand that he's the fulfillment of all these things. And so then by faith, Gentiles get grafted in. And now we're all members of the covenant 
but then you know the jews the jews they reject all this and they want to keep in line with all the old testament stuff Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they say well we don't want to they do exactly what the older brother does in this story right they point out to jesus look what they've done what do you have (laughs) look at all this look Man, look at all the crap that they've done, and you're gonna let them just watch right back, walk right back in here. I mean, what are you doing? You know? Yeah, but yeah, and so when John the Baptist came along, when when John the Baptist came along before Jesus, he starts baptizing people in the wilderness. You know, all all the all the Pharisees, all the Jews were looking at that, going, "No, that's dumb. I don't need to do that. That's that's a cleansing for Gentiles," yeah. and and the, but that's entrance into the kingdom. And that's exactly what, but that's exactly what their own prophets said was necessary because their own prophets said that there's coming a time when there's going to be a new covenant. And the way you enter into that new covenant is through the washing of water. Like that's like an Ezekiel 36, I think. The other thing that I would bring up on this, when I was a pastor, I didn't think people thought this way, but they really do. And y'all probably know a couple of people who are like this, but like there are people who think, and I've said it before, and to an extent it's true. Living the Christian life is hard. Yes. Living as a non-Christian is much harder. And I say that because the prodigal son was mad because he had always been in his father's care, but he didn't get like the gifts. But he also never found himself in a pig pen. Mm-hmm. And so when right. people tell me how like hard it is to be a Christian, that and that, I'd be like, yeah, but I've done it the other way. And hangovers are mm-hmm. terrible too. Yes. <laughs> like, right. And losing your family to like addictions and, and want, you know, prodigal living ain't yeah. no fun either. Uh, right. And so at least you're always in your father's care. And sometimes the the joy is that you've never had to experience some of the stuff that other people have to experience. And I think that's pretty important to bring up. Sure. I I think, um, I think that's important. I was going to say something. I just, just completely lost my mind. Oh yeah. Well, you know, Proverbs, I'm trying to think of the passage, but Proverbs even says that the way of a transgressor is hard. It's terribly difficult. I've tried it for 20 years of my life. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so it's living for living for God is easy compared to not compared to living without God. Because if you don't if if you're living outside of Christ, you don't have a ground of being really. Yeah, life is. I mean, I, I, some people might I might get pushback for saying it this way, but if you're as long as you're living outside of Christ, you, you know your life is completely pointless. Yeah, well, it you is. know, there's you know, eternally speaking. Right. Like, I don't understand. Like, here's the thing. I don't, I don't think a suicide prevention hotline doesn't make any sense outside of a Christian context to me. (laughs) You you understand what I'm saying? Eternally. Yes. Like eternally. But like, you know, we all have our emotions and we all have a psychological makeup that, you know, and, and so people who live apart from God can be very successful here on earth to an extent. Um, they can, right? Because I know right. I know people. Sure. But at the same time, if you're looking at it from a, a eternal eternal significance, then mm-hmm. no, right? But like, um, the other thing I would say is that the brother missed the older brother missed the fact that the work for the father was the reward itself. Mm-hmm. Like it had a there was a bad attitude there. Like. Um, when we meet for the DMT or when we meet as a ministry council, like if I'm asked to pray, I always pray, thank you for the bent or the privilege of working for you in such a way. Uh, and because working for God and not, I mean, just being around God's presence in an, in a way in which I get compensated for is one of the most amazing things ever. And we might not get paid as much as we think we should or whatnot, but man, at least, I'm doing this work for God. Not everybody gets right. to. And so, like, right. yeah, like I, I don't get paid. Well, you know, I, well, I get paid from the church, but you know, I'm just not, I'm not rolling in dough or anything, but I still, mm-hmm. I still feel bad sometimes because, because it's like, I enjoy this. I'm like, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I've seen people who, who go to work at factories and they spend 20 to 30 years working at, working at factories. Right. And like, I, I know they miserable. don't enjoy that work. Right. And I'm, 
and I enjoy what I'm doing. I feel bad because I enjoy that I get paid mm-hmm. to do this. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. I think it's important that we know because like the, the older brother just saw serving God as a duty and not as a reward in and of itself. And I think that, mm-hmm. that for preachers and when preachers get burnt out, that does happen. And preachers can mm-hmm. get critical. That does happen. That's why it's so important mm-hmm. for preachers sure. not to get burnt out. Then take mm-hmm. take care of your souls. Because yeah, I've I've been to yeah. I've been to a place of burnout before. It sucks, man. Yeah. And it'll it'll eat you it'll eat away at your soul. And I worked at I worked at gas stations and hotels before I got into full time ministry. And being in a place of burnout made me want to go running back to the hotel. Right. And no, uh, yeah, right. Like or a place of comfort. That what I would call. Yeah. It. Like, mm-hmm. All right. That's a good discussion. I think I am just going to try to wrap us up in, in, uh, because we've kind of applied some of these things, but, mm-hmm. um, Becky, I think you kind of, you took this lost and found thing because you had this personal experience about, you know, losing, yeah. almost losing your kid. And so mm-hmm. you, you bring it back at the very uh, beginning, like when I temporarily lost my son clothes shopping that day, there's a set of uh, a mixed set of emotions in these situations. Just explain to me what you're saying there. Well, you know, there was both the fear, the anxiety, the worry of what was happening, but at the same time, seeing him sitting there in front of me was just joyful and exuberance and excitement. And so it's, it's both, it's both. And, um, you know, when we are found again, an, an example of my story, um, when I was found again, there was the guilt, the shame, the regret, uh, the repenting of what I had done. But at the same time, there was excitement and joy and just this beautiful brightness that was building inside of me because I, I recognized that even though I had all this stuff that I needed to work through, that God still wanted me, that God still needed me, that he still loved me and cared for me. And I, so I think there's a both and um, that we have to work through when we're lost and found or when somebody in our congregation is lost and then found. Right. Um, you know, how many times do we, you know, I would love it if every time that we had a person come up to the altar for a profession of faith and, and repenting of what they have done, I would love everybody in the congregation to just drop what they're doing to have a huge round of applause, some shouts of excitement because this lost person has come home. And that's what we should feel like when when we have lost people in our lives that recognize where they have done wrong and that God still loves them and wants them back to both ends. Um, So Logan, you wrote the, uh, while I'm trying to end this, let me go ahead and open up another discussion. No, because I think it's the attitude, it's the attitude of the Pharisees that Jesus was trying to illustrate. Number one, mm-hmm. God's love is gra- is extravagant and ours is terrible. And and I think the church sometimes does that as well. I I unfortunately have been a cause of how many have you Logan, you wrote the uh, lesson, I think, for um Jonah, right? Yes. I mean, in some sense, this is Jesus critiquing Jonah's attitude. Like one of the reasons why Jonah just did not want to go to Nineveh is because he was so afraid that God would give them mercy. Yes. And I, and I seriously, and I was in a really good church, but I know that there were some people who just didn't like other people and they would just assume not spend eternity with them. (laughs) <laughs> and so I think this is exposes our hearts. What do you think? Well, I mean, like, is, is there some, why, why does a story like Jonah happen? Well, I think it, why happens, would it happen in churches today. Sure. I think it happens because we've got a reputation to keep and we've got a resume to build up uh, before hey, God. Another one. Yeah. So <clears throat> here's, here's what I think. I think we, get to a place where we have forgotten where we come from, where we forget the love of God toward yeah. us. And right. so we think, and so everything is, everything is becomes performance based. And so when people aren't performing the way we want them to perform or performing like us, then we get oh. really frustrated. 
And so whenever, and so whenever someone comes into the congregation, like if someone came into the congregation and they repented and uh, made a profession of faith, joined the church or whatever, some folks might get frustrated because they know how that person lived and they don't know that they're going to be able to, they don't know that they're going to be able to, to perform well. Right. Then that's just, I mean, we wouldn't say it in those words, but that's what it is. We don't think they'll be able to perform well, like we allegedly do. And so when they don't do that, we just think, oh, well, they're a hopeless cause. Now I'm going to tell y'all something um, kind of personal to me. I, I have a cousin named Becky. She and I are not particularly close. We talk sometimes on Facebook. Um, But she got saved a few years ago. And if I did not know her story, and if I did not know her background, I probably would have a very cynical view of whether or not salvation um, radically changed people. Because let me tell you something, that girl, that, that girl was on drugs. She was hanging out with the wrong people. She was, she was living like the devil, man. And she was in jail. Like every time I, every time uh, I would talk to her, her grandma or her, was it her grandma or her, uh, her aunt? That's who it was. Every time I'd talk to her aunt, she would say, pray for Becky. She's in jail again. You know, things like that. And about three or four years ago, after she got out of jail this last time, something happened to her. It was, well, I know what happened. It was Jesus. But man, she just changed radically. And she got involved in, she got involved in, uh, in church. She's going to, she's going to Hillcrest Pentecostal Church of God in Atkins and she is just on fire for God, man. And, and she like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know any other way to describe it. Her life was just radically changed for the better. And I know it was God. It was completely a God thing. Um, and people with and a like, history like that sometimes can find it difficult, at least to go back to their home church or the places yeah, that absolutely. they grew up. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if that was, I mean, I know that's her home church I'm, now. I don't, but I don't know where her home church was exactly but that's where she goes now she's deeply involved in church she's there every time the doors are open she's like the president of their women's ministry now well good for her wow yeah she's oh man like she's just on i'm gonna i'm gonna actually message her and tell her (laughs) that i told that i told y'all her testimony kind of um but she was just in a terrible place and now she's in a much healthier place and she is on fire for God. And whenever I start to think that maybe this stuff just doesn't happen anymore, whenever I start to think that people just don't change anymore, I think about Becky. Oh. Maybe it's just the name. Is it the name Becky that <laughs> I don't know. You got that halo? I, I do. Yeah, here. Let me <laughs> let me put my halo on. Yeah, no, that's, can... this is a good discussion. And, and I hope this uh, Luke 15 is going to, there it there is. There we go. I was going to get the halo on at some point. <laughs> uh, awesome. So thank y'all again for your work. I'm Again, I'm really excited about this spring quarter. I just, when I read it and edited it and all that good stuff and, and saw the finished product, I'm just really happy with it. And I'm hoping there's going to be, my prayer is a lot of churches start getting back in person and can, yeah. In fellowship, you know, healthy and safely, but um, um, we so we made these radical changes to the encounter, and it's been like two and a half months now, and there's churches that don't even know that it's changed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, we'll see how all that works. Uh, we need to get so the word share. Out, man. If, if you're watching this today, yeah. share the news that it has changed with, yeah. with somebody in another church. Yeah, so. it's 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 new, it's improved. Get the word out. We need to have like an encounter con, man. We need to just. <laughs> no, I'm thinking about that. There's a lot of people who use the encounter that are real passionate. And I think we could. Here's what I think we could do. Um, if we could afford to do so, this would be great. First, probably um, not, but never, never let that get in the way of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> here, no, well, here's what I was thinking we could do 
is send out a sample quarterly to every CP church that doesn't use the encounter with a letter saying, hey, we've updated the encounter. This is what it looks like now. And and see what happens. Yeah. See if there's a return on that investment. Yeah, y'all pray about that because, I mean, like I've done a lot of that. Um, but the way we get our information out in this, in our church is through presbyteries and, you know, preacher gatherings and these kinds of things. And, and all that came to a screeching halt about the time we yeah. were trying to reduce. So, so yeah, keep praying about yeah. that. Keep, get your word of mouth and tell people and encourage your churches to look at it. And, and of course you can and dude, I, I got a free will Baptist friend. I got a free will Baptist pastor friend who's thinking about using it for his church. He's not even Cumberland Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we've done a really good job. So, okay, so we pepper all ourselves. Uh, and so, yay, go, go us. But but uh, thank you all, uh, Sunday school teachers and Christian educators, pastors, for everything that you do in the church. Um, we're just trying to help do the, the to help the discipling and, and to fulfill that part of the Great Commission. So God bless you all. We'll see you again next week.